Welcome to Unite. Uh, we are starting our second year of Unite today. This is Unite number 53. Our anniversary was actually on, I believe, Labor Day on Monday, because the calendar flips. Today's 52? This is 52? Okay. I'm going to challenge you that that's not right, but I'll, I'll, I'll let you know. Then maybe I'm wrong. Okay. Um, we want to welcome Marcus Zender, a professor at Biola, who will be our speaker today. Welcome, and we're glad you're here. So uh, we're looking forward to hearing what you have to say. Um, a couple of uh, family news uh, items. Um, Larry Droke uh, passed away last night. Uh, they uh, were living out in the Marietta area, and uh, he uh, passed away overnight. And the word came this morning, so uh, there will be a memorial service, I'm sure, somewhere, whether it's out at the church in Marietta area or, and or one here. So we'll get you more information about that. And um, I'm sorry, I have to get down to my notes. I didn't have them in order. But the other uh, issue was we had a passing of uh, Richard Graham. Uh, this past week, and uh, Elma, uh, his uh, widow, was here at first service, and there will be a service uh, for Richard here at the church on Sunday the 26th. Uh, Linda Free is arranging the food for the memorial, and uh, Elma would appreciate two additional pallbearers for the service here at the church um, on the 26th, the day of the memorial service. Um, so we have um, a lot of things going on here at Sunny Hills. Last week, as you might know, uh, we were not here at the building. We were at the beach, and there will be um, some more to say about that just in a little bit, about um, what was on um, the beach happening last week. Uh, before this church, uh, before this uh, class starts, of course, there are things going on here at the building. Uh, John Free is teaching a class in the fellowship hall about uh, on Revelation, and um, there's a singing class going on in the elder's office ahead of time. And coming up starting next Sunday, the 15th, uh, the Payton, Stephen Terry, will be starting a uh, Building Strong Marriages seminar series. Uh, it'll go pretty much the whole quarter through uh, December 15th on most Sundays at 5 p.m. in the Fellowship Hall. So add that to your calendar. I'm, I'm quite confident uh, we'll have good attendance, and it'll be very, very worthwhile to come and hear what they have to say about Building Strong Marriages. Um, today I was told that there is a second Sunday singing at the State College Church of Christ in Anaheim at 2 o'clock, so if you're interested in attending, they would uh, welcome you there. Uh, the new church directory is out. If you don't have one yet, you can pick one up. Uh, we can get them to you. I have uh, several of uh, them stashed away around, so I can hand you one directly if you need one. If you don't have one, it's just one per family, please. The chili cook-off comes up on the 29th. Uh, the Dorknack family will be entertaining us. And uh, there are sign-up sheets on the patio today. We are having competitions not only for chili, but also for ice cream. So you can make your concoctions of either or either or both, and, uh, or just come and judge, or just come and enjoy. So that is on the 29th uh, with the chili cook-off. And the Sunshine Ladies Luncheon resumes on Thursday the 19th, but this coming Tuesday at 9.45, the Ladies Bible Class resumes from its summer break. Uh, Mari will be taking some time off to have Lila. Um, she's amazingly beautiful. She's just glowing. Um, Lila's due uh, in about two weeks, and uh, her uh, last day here uh, scheduled would be on Friday, this coming Friday, uh, unless Lila has other plans. So, um, and she'll be taking off about five or six weeks. She'll be back uh, around uh, the 29th of October. So that's the plan. Um, that's all I have at the moment, I think. Yes. Oh, Jim Lance. Yes, sir. Do I have the date? Oh, it's not Saturday the 26th? 21st. Saturday the 21st? Okay, sorry. I could have fat-fingered it, of course, but sorry. I'm glad, it, glad somebody caught it. Thank you. If you would, greet someone next to you, and uh, we'll get started in just a moment. Welcome. Glad you're here. I have to 
do the reading though first, right? Not yet. No, not yet. Hold on. Well, to, no? Uh, we have the baptism. Um, oh, so last week, if you weren't, if you weren't with us, we did not have Unite here. We had a very special Unite beach baptism service at the beach, and uh, we were so excited that four people got baptized last week. So uh, I was excited that we were able to spend, uh, I mean, one year of Unite, and then we, we were able to kind of complete that year with four baptisms. So um, if you weren't with us, Last week, we have a video to show you uh, what happened. So please turn your attention to the screen. Making this video while hormonal and pregnant, I was just crying the entire time. <laughs> so um, this brings me so much joy. If you look at every single person, the, the smiles on their faces of not only being able to be baptized, but seeing their entire, like they're, they're a huge church family just like cheering them on. It's really just a glimpse of heaven, of, of how it's going to look like. So um, we're going to continue the celebration by inviting Lauren up. Uh, who was baptized last week. Lauren, um, just to remind you what happened, just in case you forget, <laughs> um, we created, we made a plaque for you, and it says, Lauren Kegley, baptized into Christ, September 1st, 2019, baptized by me, Sunny Hills Church of Christ, Fullerton, California, and Isaiah 40, 29 through 31 is on there. So this is all yours. Congratulations. All right, so um, thank you so much. We're going to continue with the service uh, with Mr. Nieto. Right, we have a reading, which hopefully there it is. Say this with me, please. It's from uh, the, um, Isaiah chapter 42, verse 3. A bruised reed he will not break, and a smoldering wick he will not snuff out. In faithfulness he will bring forth justice.
Will you pray with me? Dear God, we thank you so much for today. We thank you for the ability to gather together to worship you. We thank you for all the open hearts today that work hard to um, make Sundays happen and to make the rest of our weeks happen. God, I pray for every single person here um, that you can reach into their hearts and teach them something today. Uh, God, I pray that we all have our open hearts to, um, to the wonderful words that Marcus will give us later today, and I pray that we can worship you with our full hearts um, and our full minds and our full spirits. And in Jesus' amazing name we pray. Amen. Would you please stand and join us in worship? Meanwhile, Saul was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. He went to the high priest and asked him, asked him for letters to the synagogues to Damascus. I, I am so sorry. So that if he found any there who belonged in the way, whether men or women, he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. As he neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? Asked Saul, Saul asked. I am Jesus, 
whom you are persecuting. He replied, Now get up and go into the city, and you will be told what, to do, what you must do. The men traveling with Saul stood there, speechless. They heard the sound, but did not see anyone. Saul got up from the ground, but when he opened his eyes, he could see nothing. So they led him by the hand to, into Damascus. For three days he was blind and did not eat or drink anything. In Damascus, there was a disciple named Ananias. The Lord called to him in a vision, Ananias. Yes, Lord, he answered. The Lord told him, go to the house of, jo of, on, go to the house of Judas on Straight Street and ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul, for he is praying. In a vision, he has seen a man named Ananias come and place his hands on him and restore his sight. Lord, Ananias answered, I have heard many reports about this man and all, all the harm he has done to your holy people in Jerusalem. And he has come here with authority from the chief priests to arrest all who call on your name. But the Lord said to Ananias, Go, this man is my chosen instrument to proclaim my name to the Gentiles and their kings and to the people of Israel. I will show him how much he, he must suffer for my name. Then Ananias, Ananias went to the house and entered it. Placing his hands on Saul, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road as you were coming here, has sent me so that you may see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediately, something like scales fell from Saul's eyes, and he could see again. He got up and was baptized. And after taking some food, he regained his strength, and Saul spent several days with the disciples in, in Damascus. At once, he began, he, at once he began to preach in the synagogues that Jesus is the Son of God. All those who heard him were astonished and asked, Isn't he the, one, who, the man who raised havoc in Jerusalem among those who call on his name? And hasn't he come here to take them as prisoners to the chief priests? Yet Saul grew more and more powerful and baffled the Jews living in Damascus by proving that Jesus is the Messiah. After many days had gone by, there was a conspiracy among the Jews to kill him. But Saul learned of their plan. Day and night, they kept close watch on the city gates in order to kill him. But his followers took him by night and lowered him in a basket through an opening in the wall. When he came to Jerusalem, he tried to join the disciples, but they were all afraid of him, not believing that he was really a disciple. But Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles. He told them how Saul, on his journey, had seen the Lord, and that the Lord had spoken to him, and how in Damascus he had preached fearlessly in the name of Jesus. So Saul stayed with them and moved about freely in Jerusalem, speaking boldly in the name of the Lord. He talked and debated with the Hellenistic Jews, but they tried to kill him. When the believers learned of this, they took him down to Caesarea and sent him off to Tarsus. So let me just take a moment and, uh, and introduce Marcus to you. Uh, Marcus Zendler is my, my neighbor who Jill and I have uh, gotten to know. He's been uh, uh, in our area for a little over two years, I think, and uh, just over one. It feels like I've known you forever, Marcus. But anyway, we, we, uh, we, we spent some time at Christmas talking about uh, our faiths and, and uh, talking about uh, the fact that Marcus teaches Hebrew at Biola, which I think is awesome, and he teaches Old Testament, which I think is awesome. So we have a lot to talk about. And uh, uh, recently, over the summer, he spent, I think, seven weeks in Europe, and he had, had done some work with some churches, and he had brought some uh, a, a service to them with uh, the format and the communion service and all of that. And I said, man, we, we've got this uh, Unite thing, and we'd love to experience something new and different, and and maybe, and we'd... We'd love for you to come and just share something with us. And he agreed. So I was like, yeah, we'll set a date, and uh, today's that day. And, and I know that, uh, I think we know Mary, did you know? I think there's going to be a couple of songs that are going to be uh, German songs translate, translated in English that will go with the message. So we will do our best to sing those. 
uh, when it comes time. <laughs> but uh, we're just happy to have Marcus here, and and uh, it's all it's all yours now, my friend. Thank you very much, all of you. Uh, please let us pray. Heavenly Father, we ask you that you will make your word alive in our hearts and minds. Please open our hearts and minds to learn from you. Guide us on our path, we ask. Amen. Dear brothers and sisters, we want to walk through our long text in three steps and just dig out some of the many lessons that we are taught in this chapter. We will first look at Paul, then at the Christians around Paul, and finally at God. So let's first look at Paul. Paul is an interesting character even before his conversion, and in some ways even a quite modern one. He grew up in an environment that was very multicultural, and in this somehow comparable to LA today. But his city, Tarsus, was geographically far away, in the southeastern part of what is today Turkey. The dominant culture was Hellenistic, which was marked by a very globalist, multicultural ideology. But at the same time, Paul grew up in a Jewish home, and he took the latter very seriously, so much so that he left Tarsus to study in Jerusalem. And he was such a brilliant student that he was allowed to study with the biggest scholar of that time, Rabbi Gamaliel. And Paul was not only a brilliant mind, but also absolutely committed and zealous for the defense of what he saw as right. Observing the case of Paul, we can easily see that commitment as such, pursuing energetically a goal, working hard and effectively, is not commendable in itself. It really depends whom we are committed to, what exactly we are pursuing. Amen. Paul, tragically, was really convinced that what he pursued so energetically was right also in the eyes of God. And was he not in a position to assess this correctly? After all, he was very learned and knew God's word thoroughly, studied it constantly. And moreover, his rejection of the Christian's claims was shared by the vast majority of his people, including their elites. This shows, depressingly and alarmingly, that neither knowledge nor the majority opinion are necessarily reliable guides to truth. In fact, in the biblical world, and very much in line with what we can observe throughout history, it is exactly the majority and the elites who get it wrong most of the time. So when your views on this or that matter are mainstream, in line with the establishment, and especially with mainstream media, very likely something has gone wrong. Of course, not as a hard and fast rule for each individual case, but certainly a bell should ring to give another close look at the specific topic in question. We need to go even one step further. Paul was, after all, not fully wrong because he was zealous for the right God the God of Israel, not for Baal or Marduk in biblical terms or in modern categories for Allah or some Buddhist principle. And yet, even if it was for the true God, it was still wrong. 
So we can be in contact with God, read the Bible, and yet get it utterly wrong. So again, we better step back and double check. Now, so far we have been looking at Paul before his conversion. What about after his conversion? One point stands out in his preaching in Damascus. It says in our chapter in verse 22 that Paul proves that Jesus is the Christ. The Greek word used here is very strong. Paul is not said to use clever rhetoric or to be able to convince others because of some special charismatic traits. But he is able to prove his point, not just to make a strong and coherent argument, or to show that it is somehow plausible or the best guess worth trying that Jesus is the Christ. No, the point is clear beyond any doubt. That is what proving means. I think that here is one of the key weaknesses of most churches probably the world over. That we have lost this and think that proof is a concept that can be applied only in the realm of natural science. And that faith is something that cannot be proven. Faith is needed, we think, because things are not fully clear. But this is wrong. Faith is not needed because of a lack of knowable facts, but it's actually building on facts, on historical facts, that everyone who has eyes can see. Our text does not elaborate on how exactly Paul makes the proof but there is really only one possible way how it may have worked. Because Jesus has done for every observer to see the deeds that the Old Testament announces the Messiah will do, that is why there can be no doubt that Jesus is in fact the Messiah. So that is what we need to do to study the Old Testament and learn what, it, learn what it says about the Messiah and then see how the description of Jesus in the New Testament matches the picture drawn in the Old Testament. It's very straightforward. And that means for our outreach to persons outside of the Christian faith, it's not about finding psychologically clever ways to talk them into believing something that is actually not quite clear. But it is about removing obstacles by soberly and patiently demonstrating how what Jesus did matches the announcements of the Messiah written down centuries earlier in the Old Testament. The accordance between prediction and fulfillment proves in the real strict sense of the word that Jesus is the Messiah and therefore the one who is worthy to be Lord and Master in our lives. So no guessing, but knowing. Of course, this is not all that would need to be said concerning outreach, but it is one important element. And this way of making the argument is, of course, also the way how we disprove the false claims of other figures who want people to believe in something else. The most obvious counterexamples relevant today in our part of the world are perhaps Joseph Smith and Mohammed. In both cases, there is a claim by them to be sent by God, quite similar to Jesus, but without any evidence based on the correlation between previous announcement and subsequent fulfillment. And it is very weird to think that it is now seen as a sign of enlightened tolerance to show respect for such types of completely unsubstantiated claims 
In fact, I think such tolerance is an attack on sound common sense. This was clear for most reasonable people until about 100 or perhaps even 60 years ago, but no longer in our times of confusion. So that was Paul before and after his conversion. Now, what about the Christians around him? The main point here is the word sober versus naive or taken away by enthusiasm. Both Ananias in Damascus and then later the Christians in Jerusalem are at first soberly skeptical against Paul. And the text is far from chastising them for this attitude. Past experience has its weight and there is no demand that it must simply be ignored or lightly brushed away. Paul really was a danger before his conversion, and so it is just right to check very carefully whether his new stance is true or just a ruse. As Christians, we are nowhere encouraged to become naive or cover up with some kind of pseudo-love that covers all difficult parts of life or the difficult parts of history, both personal and communal. On the other hand, we also see in how Paul is dealt with by the Christian congregations in Damascus and Jerusalem that it is very important to flexibly adapt to new developments. It is not the case that because Paul has been in the past a fierce, a fierce persecutor of the Christians, that this is still so necessarily today. Things do change. And we would be both unloving and unjust when we put people in a certain box once and for all and not allow that they may indeed have changed or might change in the future. This is especially important in the field of our close relationships. Oh, I know this neighbor. Oh, I know how my spouse is. Oh, I know how my parents are. No, we must not tie other people down on their past behavior. We take it seriously, but at the same time, we also allow for the possibility that they have changed or that they are other dimensions of their character which we have not yet detected. So we need both, an earnest consideration of the past, but at the same time also an openness for new developments. This is a guiding principle in many areas of life, including, I would say, the field of politics. Another second side of the soberness that we see in our text is that Twice, Paul is helped by his Christian brothers to escape from the enemies who want to get after his life and make him silent once and for all. We see that there is no over-spiritualized longing for martyrdom, but just a sober assessment of the danger of the situation and the natural God-given instinct to take the necessary steps to avoid being apprehended and killed. If God decides that the time has come for us to lay down even our lives as witnesses for him, he will show it and likely close possible escape routes. But it is not always time for this and it is right to flee when it's possible. And this doesn't apply just for threats of physical martyrdom, but also for less violent attempts to shut us down in our witnessing of the gospel. And I would take this point even one step further, just drawing out the line that we see here. We would certainly not be called to support in the realm of competing worldviews and especially in the political realm, those whom we know might be willing to do harm 
to the followers of Christ. In the current situation in the West, it's not very difficult to identify what the ideologies are that are most likely to go down that path. All types of totalitarian inclinations, especially strict versions of secularism slash socialism, and Sharia complaint Muslim orthodoxy. It would be stupid and naive to ignore the historically identifiable threats that such ideologies pose. And stupidity in this area does not have dire consequences only for us, but also for those who already now are physically persecuted in other parts of the world. Jesus has not educated his disciples to be stupid. And the last point, what, very briefly, what does God do? The first important observation here, we have looked at what Paul does before and after his conversion, but not during the conversion itself, for a good reason. The conversion is basically God's own business. You see, God does not make an offer to Paul. I invite you to change course and receive salvation if you wish. No, he does not ask or invite Paul, but simply breaks Paul's resistance through an irresistible supernatural disclosure of who he is. God is the one who begins the process and carries it through. This is important because we have a tendency in modern evangelicalism against what all the reformers thought about this, that our salvation is wrought in some kind of collaboration between God, who makes an offer, and our decision to accept it, where ultimately, in fact, our decision is the crucial element and the focus of our perception and attention. But biblical faith really is exactly looking away from ourselves and focusing on what God has done for us and is still doing. He is the one who breaks resistance, ignites faith, and in fact, as Paul says in Romans 4, raises the dead. You cannot make dead persons alive by calling them to stand up. But they need to be given life. Of course, then they will actively use the new life they have received. And they are called to do so. But the decisive act is on God's side. But, and that's the last point, it's not just about conversion. Twice in our passage, the Greek verb day is used, which means it is necessary, necessary, and really is an expression of divine ordinance. At the very moment of the conversion encounter with the Lord, the Lord tells Paul that now his life is under this day, this necessity has no longer control over it. And this is, in a way, characteristic more generally for what it means to be Christian, no longer trying to steer the boat ourselves, but having the Lord in a position to command where we go and what we do at each step. In the second instance where this day, this necessity is used, this divinely ordained necessity is specifically about Paul's suffering in the future. Now clearly Paul's calling is special. He mentions himself later in one of his letters that he someone somehow completes the Lord's sufferings, which is unique, that's not on us. But in a more general way, this is again true for all who follow Christ. We are called not to have a good time and a successful life, 
but called to bear the cross. Suffering, especially suffering for Christ's sake, is not a sign of defeat, a sign of being abandoned by God. There's no promise that we will have earthly success and enjoyment, though we still may get some of it. What we need and what we are promised, however, is that we will have communion with the Lord, however difficult the path may be. And a token of this and a fourth taste of what is to come in full completion is the communion in bread and wine at the Lord's table. Amen. Will you pray with me? Dear Lord, we are so grateful. We are so grateful for your reaching out to us, Lord, for your willingness to take us as your children. Lord, we know that you are the fount of every blessing, and we are grateful for those blessings. Lord, help us Help us hear the words of this next song, these words of praise, and, and help write them on our heart. It's in your son's name that we pray. Amen.
Would you please stand for the intercessory prayer and the Lord's prayer? With all our heart and with all our mind, let us pray to the Lord, saying after each item, Lord, have mercy. For the peace from above, for the loving kindness of God, and for the salvation of our souls, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace of the world, for the welfare of the Holy Church of God, and for the protection of the people of his first covenant, Israel, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For this congregation and all who enter this house with faith, for our ministers and teachers, for the messengers of the gospel in the whole world, for our brothers and sisters in faith, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the president of this country, for the members of his administration, for the leaders of the nations, and for all in authority, that they may hear your word and listen to it. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For this city, for every city and community, and for those who live in them, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For seasonable weather, and for an abundance of the fruits of the earth, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the sick, for the aged and infirm, for the widowed and orphans, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the poor and the oppressed, for the unemployed and the destitute, for prisoners and captives, and for all who care for them, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For those who are persecuted because of the witness for Christ, especially in Muslim countries and in all places where totalitarian ideologies reign, for steadfastness in persecution and the shortening of the suffering, and a speedy change, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For deliverance from all danger, violence, oppression, and degradation, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the absolution and remission of our sins and offenses, that we may end our lives in faith and hope without reproach, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Defend us, deliver us. In, the, in thy compassion, protect us, O Lord, by thy grace. In the communion of the saints, let us commend ourselves and one another to Christ our Lord. For yours is the majesty, O Father, O Son, and Holy Spirit. Yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory, now and forever. Amen. Let us pray how the Lord taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever. Amen. Please be seated. Jesus himself is invisibly present at the Holy Communion as the host at his table. 
Because in him we are encountering the living God himself, we want to confess our sins before him, knowing that Jesus has come to seek and redeem sinners and to heal those with a broken heart. So please join me in the confession of sins. Almighty God, Heavenly Father, we stand before you and confess that we are sinners and daily trespass your holy commandments, the wise and good orders for our life, in thoughts, words, and deeds, through ignorance, weakness, and deliberate fault. But we are truly sorry to have offended you, and therefore we ask you, have mercy on us, gracious God and Father, who is rich in mercies. Forgive us our sins, as grave as they may be, for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, who died for us. And let us rise again through the power of your Holy Spirit to a new life, bringing forth fruit of thankfulness for the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, who in his great mercy has promised forgiveness of sins to all those who with heartfelt repentance and true faith turn to him, may have mercy on us, pardon and deliver us from all our sins, confirm and strengthen us in all goodness, and bring us to everlasting life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us give glory to the Lord. Thank you. 
In, with, and under bread and wine, we participate in Christ's body and blood. We are incorporated into Christ's body, and Christ takes dwelling in us. Through this, we may partake in what Christ's offering of his body and blood has worked for us. Through Christ's death on the cross, we are reconciled with God. The new covenant is established in which we receive forgiveness and eternal life. The fruit of the cross, however, does not consist only in the forgiveness of sins, but also in the gift of the Holy Spirit. The Spirit wants to work in us as a spirit of purification and sanctification, who cleanses our inner being and purges us from the old habits that hinder us to follow Christ's calling. And the Holy Spirit equips us for the work in God's kingdom to which we are called by directing us and bestowing us on us the gifts that are needed for the building of his church. As sure as we eat the bread and drink from the cup, so Jesus offers us with certainty his gifts as the strengthening on our way and already now takes us up in the communion with him. At the same time, he directs our eyes to the future, to the coming fulfillment, when Jesus will celebrate the wedding feast with us, his congregation, when he will return unconcealed and finally establish his reign. Therefore, let us pray. Our Lord Jesus Christ, because you invite us, we now come to your table. You promise us forgiveness of our sins and the gift of the Holy Spirit through your body which is broken for us and through your blood which is shed for us on the cross. Dear Lord, we trust your promise May we fare according to your word. Amen. Because the Holy Communion is the occasion on which the unity and communion of the new covenant church is visible, we want to confess our faith with the apostolic creed which unites us with the worldwide church of all ages. And I ask you to stand for it. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father, Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation he came down from heaven, was incarnate from the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and was made man. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshiped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. Look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Let us hear the words with which Jesus has instituted the Holy Communion. 
The Lord Jesus in the night in which he was betrayed took the bread, thanked, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And after the meal he took the cup, thanked, gave it to his disciples, saying, Drink all from it. This is the blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in remembrance of me. Please say all with me. When we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim your death, Lord Jesus, until you come in glory. Draw near with faith, receive the body of our Lord Jesus Christ, which he gave for you, and his blood which he shed for you. Eat and drink in remembrance that he died for you, and feed on him in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving.
Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we come before you with thanks and praise. You have brought us into communion with your Son. You have delivered him into death so that we could live. Do not let us forget this grace, but help us to steadily grow in the faith that renders us able to do good works and to focus our life in its entirety to enhance your glory and to further the well-being of our neighbors. Amen. Please stand for the last song and the blessing. This next song is, um, Professor Zeller, would you help me pronounce it? Is God for me? Is God for me? Um, yeah, so is God for me so trete if God himself be for me? <laughs> if God himself. So it goes with yeah. the message, and it's translated from German. Thank you. said after his resurrection, as my Father has sent me, thus I am sending you. Thus he enlists us in his service at the table of communion. We were his guests, we have received his spirit, and thus we are now called to carry this love into the world. So go into this week with the blessing of the Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. Amen. <laughs>